missing Shay and we're missing um, Lily. So um, the, we have a smaller group today. So some of you guys will need to pick up the slack for us a little more than normal. Um, but we have an excellent plea. I read this probably the first time since I was an undergraduate along with you guys. And I found this a really riveting and compelling play as, as I read it. It's an interesting one to do right after Twelfth Night because a lot of the stuff that we talked about last week with Twelfth Night, about social class and um, things like that show up here in this play. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Reading a Webster play in between a couple of Shakespeare plays, this is this is going to prove interesting because the stuff we talked about in Twelfth Night is still very applicable to this one. But um, Savannah, I will uh, give you the floor. You can do your presentation. Okay, so. I haven't seen your presentation yet, so I, I'm eager to see it. So let me give you the ability to share your screen. So you should have that ability. So <clears throat> Savannah, whenever you are ready, you should be able to share your PowerPoint. Okay, let me see what I can do here. Did you have an easier time doing this one than you did when you tried Agamemnon <laughs> earlier in the year? So far, I have uh, is there something wrong with your audio? Yeah, you kind of faded there, Savannah. There we go. There's the PowerPoint. Okay. There we go. I can hear you now. Better now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I did mine on the Duchess of Mafia. Um, honestly, I handled this one a lot better than the one I originally wanted to go for, just for the fact of. It was very much <laughs> of drama filled. This is what I picture the forbidden love, the patriarchy of how she was treated in this. Um, I found it very, very much a good read as a feminist. If you are very much, um, how you say, old fashioned. This probably isn't the one for you. <laughs> um, I know in the beginning of it, the theme is mainly back in, it was written in the 1600s, but it was based in the 1500s back when, back when women didn't really have many rights. It it's based on a true story. It's about a royal family in Italy. Um, honestly, a lot of John Webster's work is very, very dark. Um, if you read some more of his, it comes out not so much chaos, I guess, but more out of the ordinary than anything. As in, like, it's not your basic... Uh, how do you say, original play, I guess. He tries to take a veer off on it, but if go I, ahead. If, I, if I had to say anything about the difference between Webster and Shakespeare, Webster's a lot more edgy, I think. Yeah. That would probably, that would probably be how I would put it. That's what I was going to say. I couldn't find the exact wording for it, but most definitely he had, he's... <laughs> the emo version of Shakespeare, if you want to be honest. <laughs> but I found it very good. The Duchess, she inherited her position from her late husband, the Duke of Malfi. And that 
in her case was very rare seeing that they had no children. So she was in a very, very unique position. Here we had a time where women didn't have a thought process or anything. They was just things to make babies and make food. And even then some. Um, during this time, she fell in love with her steward, Antonio, who was very, very low class. And her falling in love with him and him falling in love with her was something that was strictly forbidden. Hence the whole forbidden love tragedy. Um, but in her position, she was very lucky because she had, I guess, more power than any woman could imagine during that time. It was something that you couldn't think ever would happen to you. So she was very lucky in her case on that. But what happened was after she, her husband passed away right after she was married, her two brothers, let me see if I can say the name right, the Cardinal and Ferdinand, um, they was very, very corrupt and made it very clear that they didn't want her to remarry simply because that would take away their power in the situation because it was kind of like the, oh, you don't have a man to take care of you, so I'll be that man ordeal. I'll be that devil on your shoulder to uh, guide you through. But she ends up telling them that she's already married. She ended up proposing to Antonio, who I believe, yeah, Antonio. During her time with him, she ends up proposing to him with her ring that her late husband gave her, which is very taboo in this case because she talks about I think it's on let me find my page real quick she talks about it was her wedding ring I did vow to never part with it but to my sex, second husband and Antonio talks about how you have parted with it now. She said yes to help your eyesight. And he talks about going on to be blind, blinded by her love and such. But using her wedding ring from her late marriage was very much no. That ring is a good symbolism also in this play because it symbolizes, I guess, how different she is and how she wanted to be outside of the box. She wasn't your basic woman that listened to any man. She, when proposing, I believe, I've watched and read a couple different uh, videos on this and articles, but one of the videos I had watched, it talked about how when proposing, he got down on one knee to try to propose to her, and she brought his face up to hers, basically showing, you're not lower than me. You are next to me. You are as powerful and in the same class as me. But soon after this happens, Basolo finds out she's married someone. She doesn't know, he doesn't know who. And he can't find out who. And at one point he sits, I think, in her closet of her room to listen and hears Antonio talking and doesn't know exactly who it is. Um, after this, Ferdinand finds out. And of course, um, he tells, sorry, what the name is, a solo, a solo tells Ferdinand about this and says, hey, she's married to someone. I can tell something's wrong. She looked, I know in one of the um, readings I did, I seen a video and it talks about how Basola um, thought she was, thought he was, oh my goodness, thought she was pregnant 
and ended up giving her three nectarines, which was supposed to induce you in labor. And she actually fell ill after this. Um, she tells him, Ferdinand, that she is lawfully married and he simply does not care. He says, you will not marry a lower class. He better be upper class and if not the same. And doing this, she ends up playing with Antonio. And Ferdinand and his brother Cardinal ends up hunting her down and hunting through Italy. Now, let me see here. During this time, they split up in Italy. And what happened is Antonio ended up taking one of the children and she split with the other two. After they found out about Antonio and Malfi splitting up with the children, um, the Duchess and her children were eventually caught and uh, put in jail. After this, they ended up finding um, her brother finds them and tortures her and her two children, basically strangling them to death. And they basically lied beforehand before killing her and tricked her into believing that Antonio was dead and there was no help for her or her, or her children. That she was simply doomed for her actions. Basola. Um, now he is actually a spy that Ferdinand and the Cardinal convinced her to hire, but she didn't know. He ends up spying on her and she consoles in him a couple times and basically says, I don't know what to do here. But after all this, Basola. After working with Ferdinand and the Cardinal, he eventually sees that he is basically in the wrong place at the wrong time. He doesn't want to do this anymore. He tries to console the brothers and say, hey, this needs to stop. We're killing kids. He accidentally killed Antonio. I believe he was actually trying to kill one of the brothers in this situation, he waits to try to jump and attack one of the brothers, and doing so, he kills Antonio. But after all this, he's begging them to stop, stop what we're doing. Eventually, they end up somehow killing each other. Basically, they argued back and forth about the whole situation. Antonio's dead at this point. The Cardinal is dead at this point. Ferdinand dead. And Basola ends up wounding himself in the process. In some readings, I did see that they said he died, but I've seen a little bit of both. Um, by the end of it though, Basola vouches to basically take the child to Antonio's friend before his death. He makes it arranged to where um, Antonio's friend would take care of the child in hopes of uh, the child continuing the throne. I've seen a little bit of variations on this. I have seen a couple of them who talks about how uh, the Cardinal goes insane and believes he's a wolf at one point. <laughs> I've seen a video of that and basically uh, Ferdinand talks about, brother, please tell me you're not losing your mind. Please tell me you're not uh, losing in this. That's, a, that's actually Ferdinand who... Uh, Is it Ferdinand? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Basola dies too, I think, in in the script because I just I was scrambling to reread it before class. So uh, okay. yeah, so he he dies in the play. Okay, I think that's all I got. Okay. Okay. 
Hmm. Well, you gave us a good uh, summary on the play for sure. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back and watch it again. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back and watch it again. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back and watch it again. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back
and they will defend their the structures of power. Um, the, we have social class as a theme. We have, um, I think, Savannah, you mentioned feminism, right? The Duchess, the, one of the reasons why you read this play, we still read this play even today, the Duchess is one of the great fit proto, I use the word proto feminist, but she's one of the great proto feminist characters in the literature. You know, we talked before in this class about the marriage economy. People back then did not get married uh, out of love most of the time. People got married for financial reasons. The Duchess has already been married for financial reasons. She's now a widow. She's still young. Um, so she has money. So she doesn't have to marry for money. So rather than, so I guess the issue is rather than letting her brothers use her to let her brothers consolidate more power for themselves, she decides that she's going to marry on her own, right? Out of love. She loves Antonio, right? She, like, one of the mo most touching scenes in the whole play is actually the scene where she, she proposes to him, right? That's unheard of in the 1600s, right? Still today, you don't really hear that happening much. Usually it's the guy who has to, uh, to propose, but she proposes to him, and um, you know, lots of discussion has happened about her character, how she holds, despite all the suffering she has to undergo in this play, she still maintains her dignity and her composure. Um, think about. I think a good way to maybe talk about her character will be to co to contrast her with previous women we've read about. Like, how does the Duchess contrast with uh, Medea, for instance? Medea also underwent a lot of suffering, but um, the way that they both handle that is extremely different. So that that's. Another, that's a general impression I took away from the Duchess's character. I'm just kind of waxing a loud of my fault. It's not too often I have fresh thoughts on this stuff. Um, but um, yeah, that was that was a thought that struck me. Of course, we have the Cardinal here as as um, a character as well. Uh, one thing to note: this play was this play was written. Webster was a generation after Shakespeare. Webster was part of the Jacobean era of literature, so he was writing plays under King James, um, where Shakespeare was writing both under Elizabeth and James. But the Protestant Reformation had already happened. So um, there was Puritanism that spread all over England at this point, as we had talked about before. Um, so it's interesting that we have that we kind of we're kind of in this world of Italy in the play. Very rarely do you see in, in English Renaissance drama. Rarely do you see these tragedies take place in England. Usually, they always take place far away. Even in probably Macbeth is probably, and King Lear are, are exceptions. Hamlet's in Denmark. But oftentimes, you'll have these take place in far away locations. Like if, it, if you kind of set these plays in England, it hits a little too close to home, if that makes sense. So that's oftentimes why you'll see them staged far away but setting it in this italy setting allows for this like really corrupt religious character in the cardinal and we learn that the cardinal and the pope are in cahoots with each other about their schemes 
So there's def there's definitely we can even talk about the Catholic themes in the play. We'll let the Catholic character of the cardinal and um, the corruption of the church and things like that. I think that that's definitely evident um, in the play. So you know, there's there's so many. I have so many faults. I could probably just burst at the seams. Um, but I will. Let's let's see what some of the rest of you guys thought about the play. Um, Savannah, you said you did your presentation on it, of course, but you said right. you you actually enjoyed it. It wasn't just a, a um, exercise for you. Right. Yeah, I'll be honest. I really enjoyed it just for the simple fact of, like I was saying in the beginning, how it's like when I think of a drama-filled play, I think of this. I think of a forbidden love, the runaway from the, um, I guess, true life of it. They're trying to have their own fairy tale story. They want to just be in love with their children. And be able to run their kingdom. But of course her brother and them are like. Absolutely not. You're not going to bring this uh, commoner. Into our family. And make it forbidden. You're not going to ruin our reputation this way. Right. That, that, that forbidden love theme. Is definitely one that has echo through the ages, right? What about some of the rest of you guys? Faith, what what did you think of uh, this one? What did you, did you find it a breezy read? Or did you like the characters? Um, what What's your general thoughts on this one? As always, reading was not breezy for me. Right. However, um, I did like it. I like the messages in it. I'm not so sure about the characters. I don't remember. However, everything that has been said so far is I pretty much agree with. So when, when you say you like the message, was it mostly like the um, kind of rebel against the norms? Like pave your own way is that the kind of thing you you liked in it yeah i liked that i also liked the feminism messages in there really hits home yeah this is this is the age this is an age of extreme misogyny in literature both the greeks and the renaissance time periods there's lots of misogyny, and you still you still see it through Ferdinand's eyes in the play, right? Ferdinand's the really hateful brother, but uh, the Duchess kind of transcends that, right? She. One thing I want to talk about in a second is how does she contrast with Medea, because both of them undergo some extremely awful things, but how both of them deal with their suffering is is an interesting point of contrast. Um, ben, uh, I, know, I know you usually don't talk on the mic. You can uh, put in the chat box what uh, your thoughts are. Um, Josh, what about what about yourself? Uh, what did you find? What did you make of the play in general? And what particularly did you find interesting about it? Uh, I really enjoyed the play. This was my first time listening to the play, so so I did find I did find the play enjoyable. Uh, I would say that the I would say that the main that the main theme of this would probably between the uh, how the brothers are like uh, they kind of represent the how power can corrupt people. Like one of them goes completely bonkers, while the other one turns turns completely evil. Even poisons one per a person, their mistress, in what later in the play. So, for me, this this play is about how what happens when you have too much power and and when something and when someone does something that the person in power doesn't like, 
well, that's when bad things happen, i.e. this play. Yeah, that's that's very well said. Um, yeah, I, he, def, he poisons her at the end, right? She kisses the book, and the book has poison and, and kills her. Um, this... He kind of he kind of laughs about it though, right? He's like, she was just she wanted the solo, right? So she got what she deserved, right? She he uh, he made that comment, but funnily enough, there's some dark humor there at the end with that bit because he tells he tells his servants, "Hey, I'm gonna act like my crazy brother so we can move this body out of here." So no matter what you I say, don't come. Well, when the soul that goes in to uh, avenge the family, the, the cardinal screams, and uh, they still don't come to help him because of what he said earlier, right? So there's a lot, there's a little bit of um, macabre humor there at the end with that, um, with that bit. The cardinal gets his comeuppance. Um, his his scheme backfired on him in, in a kind of a funny way. Yeah, absolute. Yeah, the how absolute power can corrupt in this case. I, I think that was very well said, Josh. Um, yeah, you. What you did? You put LOL because of how that backfired on uh, on the cardinal. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Epic fail on, on the Cardinals part. Oops. Daryl, you last but not least, what did you uh, what did you make of this read? I know last week we um we we talked about had anyone read Shakespeare before in the class, and I was one of the few who had in high school with it. This play to me was a lot like Romeo and Juliet, and I would say that that's a good thing. You know, we haven't had a whole lot of love stories. Well, I guess we kind of have, but most of them have been on the darker side or on the the um. You know, they, they sort of just had a straight, different kind of genre instead of just like a romantic drama type of play. And this one, um. I, I mean, I, I agree with everyone's art, what everyone else has said. Sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble speaking today. I agree with what everyone else has said so far, and um, it, it, it just gave me a lot of Romeo and Juliet vibes throughout the whole play, so that's what I was thinking of for a lot of it. And it does sort of show, like, the, um, the societal standards back then with the different um, wealth uh, ranges and how they tried to be misogynistic towards women. The uh, the one character going insane sort of does show like how a lot of them weren't in agreement with it, even though they tried to follow it. And that sort of displayed how eventually that's why it came to change because people started slowly realizing, wait, this is really wrong and we need to fix it. Do you think, Daryl, do you think that Ferdinand goes crazy out of guilt? For what he's done is that what your suggestion i i would assume so yes i mean he he sort of figured out that his sister had remarried against his better judgment and had kids and his response to that was killing them <laughs> and after that uh so, someone else mentioned i also read a uh like a summary or two to get a better understanding of the play and one of them also mentioned that he he like went so crazy that he thought he was a wolf for like a good chunk of the play and some versions of it. And um, I, I really don't know what else would have caused it because whenever he did, you know, order for them to be killed, that is his own sister, whether he loved her or hated her for most of their life, they're still related. And that's just a very morally wrong thing to do, especially with the kids being involved. Yeah, I think it mentions that in one part that she's actually his twin sister. That the cardinal is a younger brother, I think. But Ferdinand and the Duchess are both twins. So um, 
they share an even closer bond in, in a way, right? Because they were both in the mother's womb at the, at the same time. Um, I think that he says that right after he kills her, he says that this is the next minute after uh, I was born one minute after her, and this is one minute after her death. So we, we have currently lived the same amount of time on earth like that that was an interesting line it's it's that kind of suggestion that if you're a twin like your twin has a little part of your soul that makes sense the little part of their soul is with you so um, funny how after her death he just kind of um, loses it there i don't know if that's because they're twins um maybe but uh, that, that's what it made me think of, right? They're twins, so they're, they're really intertwined. What did you guys think of, of Ferdinand? Ferdinand? Well, like, he was so, why is he so controlling? Like, um, do you guys think that it's because of power? Um, do you guys think it's because of, uh, do you think he has some type of weird thing for his sister? Right? We talked about crazier things in this class with Oedipus. Um, does does he have some type of uh, weird sex, like sort of sexual desire for her? Um, is it because they're twins? Is it because he's a man and thinks that he can control a woman? Um, what what is up with this guy? Right? What what would one of you guys say there? Like what what drives him to be such a you know what? What, what, Josh, what, what would you say to that? Um, what, what drives uh, him? I would say that I think the play does strongly imply that he has some unhealthy attraction to his sister, whether or not it's just, you know, him being overprotective or something far more insidious. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But I would say, just as I said earlier, that... Uh, if you want something, power is going having having the power to get what you want is going to make it worse. It's like throwing gasoline on top of a on top of a spark. It's just going to make a blazing inferno. Right. So you're kind of suggesting then that it's a power. It's more or less a power trip for him. That uh, you know, he has the power, so. You might as well exert it and um it could be a thing but maybe it's more or less about control more than anything else that seemed to be what you were suggesting there yes that's what i'm saying um savannah what, what would you say to that did, what did you think of this guy did you find him overly weird as i did Ferdinand. Yeah, honestly, Ferdinand was very weird in my book. He came off very obsessed over his sister, obsessed over her power, I guess. He very much took it as, well, she's got the title, and basically I have her control. I have control over what she does, what she says, who she marries. Because back then it was very much you had to have the approval of whatever man, no matter if he's family or not, no matter if he's your father or your cousin on fifth down the line. If he was a man in your house, he had control over who you talked to, 
and who you dealt with. He was very much obsessed on the fact that he didn't want her to be with somebody. It was very much controlling and manipulative. Would you would you suggest Savannah? That's just building on what you said. Would you suggest that um, he didn't want her to be with somebody else because of his power trip? Or would you suggest there's even something a little more sinister there that he perhaps wants her for himself? Honestly, back in that time, that wasn't too unheard of sad but true of marrying family to make I guess your power quote more great greater mm. I guess um I feel like he most definitely if he could have gotten her and talked to her and persuaded her enough I feel like he definitely would have tried to have uh her for himself for the fact of he would have gained all that power and money and definitely would have had a worse power trip. Like, we thought we he snapped before. He would probably end up turning the whole city into werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said. Faith, I, you know I have to call on you on this question. Um, what did you make of this guy, the brother that man freaks me out. He should not be that obsessed with his sister. Even, I don't care how, what, what year it was. That's strange. There could be attraction. I know it's also a power thing. I'm speechless. Yeah, of course. Um, we get a, if we want to get really crazy with it, right? Power and um, like a lot of people, that's their kink, right? Like they want to be the one in control, the one in power. So, like maybe maybe that's his this his whole deal, right? That's what um, that's what gets him going, right? This this power trip. Um, but yeah, I agree, Faith. It, it is definitely a uh, odd relationship. Um, very, very unhealthy. What did the Duchess do to deserve that? Right? Arguably nothing. Right? She's she's very kind to her brothers. Um, Daryl, would you? What would you add here? Boy, do you have anything uh, the rest didn't say about Ferdinand? Um, I, I, I kind of feel like it doesn't. Um, I feel like his obsession isn't as much over the uh, the the love or sexual attraction. I think it's more or less mostly just jealousy because he felt like maybe he should be the one in power or, you know, the one to be the Dutch of Malfia instead of Duchess. You know, he, he wanted mm. to be the person she had become. And because he wasn't that, he tried with everything he had to just control what she did and try to make the choices for, you know, the thing that the Dutch or Duchess does. Whatever powers that may entail, I feel like he was trying to sort of I, I'm trying to think of the right words for it. Just sort of be the puppet master, you know. Her, her be the puppet, and him be pulling the strings on all the uh, the choices she's supposed to make and what she is in charge of. And I feel like because he wasn't able to do that, and she went against his word and got married, that's why he was so angry and ended up doing what he did. And then because of what he did, he went crazy and so on. I. Maybe there is some love there because, again, back in that time, it wasn't unheard of or unnatural to see. But I, I definitely feel like the jealousy and power um, 
areas is where it mostly stems from. Yeah, I agree, Josh. Uh, that was a good comment there on um, jealousy, power. Like, I liked your comment about the puppet master. Um, he is kind of Yago like. Like, if you, Othello is another one of Shakespeare's great tragedies. You know, Yago is one of the famous puppet master type characters. They are very similar. The cardinal, uh, cardinal on the other hand, he, I don't think he's as um, deep of a character personally. Like he seems more, he seems more like the stereotypical. Maybe maybe I'm cynical because I myself am Catholic, right? He seems like the the, the traditional, uh, like corrupt Catholic figure in the play. And there's a lot of these types of figures in Renaissance drama. Uh, probably rightfully so because the church did have a lot of its many, many problems during this time period. But uh, yeah, he, he, say, he seems uh, stereotypically evil to me. But maybe, maybe I'm just cynical. Um, You know that he and his brother are definitely in it together. And he's, as we see at the end, he's willing to take this stuff even a step further than his brother. Like he even has the affair. He even has an affair. I think you mentioned earlier. I think it was Daryl. He even has the affair with um, his his courtier's wife. Right. So. Like this, this is this is a guy who has he's a religious figure. He's a cardinal, but he has no shame at all. Um, uh, the, this this is a pretty stereotypical ca character for uh, this time period, just because um, the Eng especially in English drama, because they were very uh, hostile towards uh, Catholicism. Again, probably rightfully so at points. Um, I told you guys a couple of weeks ago about a lot of the nasty stuff the church did during the Middle Ages. But uh, I don't know. Did any of you guys feel like I'm selling the Cardinal shirt short? Um, did any of you guys maybe find him just as compelling as as Ferdinand and his evilness? Or uh, did some of you guys maybe just see him as the stereotypical corrupt religious character in these plays. Daryl, we'll, we'll start with you on that one. What did, what did you make of the cardinal? I think that I do agree with what you said about they are both in the same boat. They're both two brothers who want to to some degree control their sister and try to make her decisions for her. But I do feel like Ferdinand's definitely the weirder one or the crazier one. And you, and it sort of shows that after all of the events, whenever the Duchess is dead, it's sort of like Fer Ferdinand just goes absolutely crazy for a very vast majority after that, up until, you know, near the end when they both die. And the Cardinal, he is sort of, you know, he is with the brother. He's trying to do the same bad things, but he doesn't seem nearly as weird or obsessive about it. And he also doesn't go crazy after the sister dies. So maybe he just didn't care about her as much. Maybe he was almost more misogynistic and just sort of saw her as an object or maybe just a vessel to get more power. But it, it, it's sort of hard to tell since they both sort of do everything together for the majority of the play and I guess that's my take on that yeah you your comment made me think about when um, at one point the cardinal tries reigns Ferdinand in right Ferdinand just kind of snaps in anger when he hears about this news and the cardinal is kind of just like 
it's bad, but uh, chill out, bro. Right? Like, uh, yeah, don't don't get this mad about it. Right? Like, he's evil, but he's Ferdinand's more of like a chaotic evil. Right? He's more of like a a controlled evil, if that makes sense. Yeah, but that that your comment there made me think of that scene when he's like, "Hey." Calm down, bro. Um, we'll, we'll just get out of the order. Josh, what, what do you think about the Cardinal? I think for the narrative, I think the Cardinal is supposed to serve as a as sort of like a contrast between the other brother. So he's kind of like disagreeing on stuff just to contrast mm. how he's acting as, a, as opposed to as opposed to the narrative, just basically the author nudging, saying, "Hey, look at what this other brother's doing. Look, look at this. He's he's pretty nuts." That's that's a good point. Like a good way of qualifying the other brother's evil, right? They're both evil, but look at this guy. He's he's way more so. So uh, that that's a good point. Savannah, what about what about yourself? What did you make of the cardinal? Honestly, he didn't pop out to me that much. He basically felt like a background character in the situation. He was more of an example of what real situation rage can do to you, I guess, versus Ferdinand who was like, I can't have what I want, so I'm going to throw a tantrum and snap, <laughs> and I'm going to act absolutely crazy and bite people. And, blah, blah, blah. and versus the Cardinal, who's just like, listen, I'm mad, but I'm not, I think I'm a werewolf, I'm a howl at the moon mad. He's more of, I just want my sister to be in a good situation, and he's like the actual quote, logic from that, I guess. He just wants his sister to look good and have some power, yes, but that wasn't his main concern. He just went along with Ferdinand because Ferdinand was like, we have to do this. We have to set an example for this society and we have to make sure she's doing the right thing. That's how he came off to Cardinal, I think. And Cardinal was like, okay, we're doing good for our sister, trying to get her in a better spot, blah, blah, blah. Well, then it all just kind of flips and it gets pulled to the pure extreme. And then Ferdinand's like, I don't know what to do here, so I'm a snap. <laughs> yeah, that's... That's a good point, Savannah. Like, Ferdinand's kind of like the kid at the grocery store, right, who, who cries in line, who cries in the checkout line when mom won't buy him a sucker. Right? That's... <laughs> yeah, the, the Cardinal. The Cardinal has definitely got a, more of a voice of logic. Cold logic, perhaps, but... Uh, uh, he is not as governed by his emotions. It's it's interesting to think about like which kind of evil in this case is is worse. Is it this more chaotic evil, or is it this cold, sinister, calculating evil? Um, it's hard. It's hard to say. Like um, it makes me think of. Uh, the show Breaking Bad, right? Tuco is kind of uh, the, like a Ferdinand type of evil. Right? You, you never know what he's going to snap. Uh, Gus was more of the um, cold, calculating evil. So, like, which which one is worse? If you, if you guys are following my reference here, like sometimes I'll reference pop culture, right? Faith. Faith, I know you know about Breaking Bad Faith because you uh, 
mentioned Walter in your in your paper. So um, I love Breaking Bad. I'm gonna be Walter for Halloween this year. <laughs> you know, we'll have a class on the first of November, Faith. You should you should wear your Walter costume for uh, for class. Okay, I will. That would that would be funny. Do you have any any final thoughts on faith on the cardinal? Anything that we haven't mentioned? Not really. My thoughts were pretty much already said by everyone else. Right. Well, now let's. Uh, Let's get into, we definitely need to break down the Duchess as well as the Sola, because uh, arguably like these, these two are the heart of this play. Um, I told you guys earlier I wanted to compare and contrast the Duchess with Medea. Like both of them undergo extreme tragedy. Um, the Duchess has to the Duchess has to witness her children being killed. Right? She doesn't kill them like Medea, but she has to witness it. So both of these women have undergone a lot. Um, what I guess the question here is what makes the Duchess so compelling? Like she, to me, she seems like a st very strong character. She has she has a very strong will. She's a lot different than any other character we, character we encounter. Certainly, di but more different than the Greeks, the Greek characters. Um, may, maybe not. Maybe Lysistrata, but um, yeah, she's. I will, will we go as far here as to say that she's perfect? I don't know if we would go that far, right? Like, uh, that that can be kind of a conversation we'll have later. But uh, when we talk about Ophelia next week. But um, she's very, what, what am I, well, I'm kind of ranting here, but what am I saying? She seems like a very human character. I right? think she's, this is probably, I would go as far as to say she's definitely the most human being a woman character has been in this class so far. Like she's not an ideal character. She's not overly evil like Medea was. She's she's human, right? Um, like I don't know. I don't know if I'm kind of ranting aloud here, right? but, but that's what I take away from her. She's very stoic. Right. All the stuff that she's suffering through, she handles with dignity. Um, she seems like somebody who would be a leader of a country. So, um, and it's also a very brave move to challenge these norms about class for the time and marry out of love instead of being a pawn. So she's that that's my thoughts on on her character. Um let's go in reverse order. We'll go start with again with you, Faith, and we'll move down to Daryl. Um you mentioned earlier, Faith, you like the feminism aspects of the play. Um I know especially with with uh, Medea, um like, what would you say to that contrast, Faith? And also, what did you make of the Duchess? How would you describe the Duchess yourself? There is a major contrast in uh, in the way the Duchess and Medea is because the Duchess watched her kids die and Medea mm -hmm. killed her kids. So right. obviously, two different mindsets I don't think the Duchess would have murdered her kids, no matter how much she hates someone. Or her brother, right? Like, like Yeah, or her brother. Um, 
I think she's very easy to relate to in terms of wanting to break out of the norm and be her own leader, I guess. I don't know how to describe it. Yeah, right. She's instead of, I think you said it well there, Faith, actually. Like instead of submitting to what the society expects of her, she's kind of willing to pave her own path. Right, which is which is brave this time. Maybe you had to be a duchess to uh, to take such a step. But um yeah, she's she's willing to assert her will, right, compared to other characters. Medea maybe asserts her will in a very unhealthy way. Right? She's she, Maybe the Duchess just asserts her will in a more in a more positive way. Um, continue down the line, Savannah. What about what about you? How would you describe her? If I could use simplistic words to describe the Duchess in my book, would be kind-hearted, strong mind. And honestly, humane. I know you talked about how she's like the most human character. She's the most, how would you put it, relatable character. She is one that you could put yourself in her situation and you'd almost say, I'd pretty much do the same thing if I had to choose my own path i know in my book if i put myself in her spot i would probably do the same thing if not worse i wouldn't have lasted that long with them brothers man they would have had to go <laughs> right. um but i feel like she is very much the in the now modern words girl boss <laughs> she is very much strong-minded and empowered and just cares about her family more than anything she basically said i'll give up whatever i have to do to run away with my love and my children she if she could have survived and her brothers wouldn't have tried to chase after her i feel like she would have just created a whole new life in her book which that's all she wanted was her life with her family and she basically said, I'll give up everything. I'll give up my before family to be with the life I want. I don't want to live this fake life with a bunch of money and horrible people surrounding me. I want to be surrounded by love, even if I am broke poor. Yeah, she's you're exactly right. She's willing to even give up her title of Duchess, right? Just so that she can go live a nice, quiet life off to herself. Leave me alone. Right? I just I just want to raise my family and move on with life, right? Very, very well said, Savannah. Um, Josh, what would, would you add anything to um, what the Faith and Savannah said? Uh, I would say that uh, I I agree that uh, the that uh, the Duchess is a far uh, stronger character than Medea's, and I want to expand kind of expand on what I mean by that. Uh, when I say strength, I mean strength of character. Uh, basically, here's my here's my view. Uh, you, you can tragedy in life can contest your strength of character. How you react to something that re really bad happens when something really bad happens in your life determines your strength of character. 
in the justice's case, she handled it pretty well. Whereas with Medea, she kind of just w- took a 180 and completely destroyed everything in her path. But that's my thought on it. Yeah, we all have to go through tragedies in our lives, right? But uh, we can't act with um, extreme rashness like like Medea did. So the, the Duchess is definitely more of a model of, of fortitude and mental strength in in this case. So, yeah, that's so the theme of suffering, right? Um, I was, I was mentioning Catholicism earlier, right? Suffering is part of it. Like, um, you know, she is, she's almost saint-like with um, how she endures all of her suffering in the play. Ben, feel, you feel free to chime in, too, in the chat. Um, I don't want you to think I'm ignoring any of you. I know you're part of the chat box. Daryl, final thoughts on the Duchess. I feel like most everything that could have been said already was. Uh, she's the most relatable. She's the most, I, I, I guess you could word it as normal character. She has good morals and she, you know, she falls in love and just wants to be with that person. She doesn't try to let others control her and decide her actions for her. And I think that's an admirable thing. I, I definitely agree with what Josh said, that, that they were both put in a similar situation, but, you know, um, the Duchess more or less just died with grace and sort of took um, the hand she was dealt when Medea sort of just killed everything and ran away. <laughs> but, um, yeah, she's definitely... I would say the most relatable and um, the most normal character there. She didn't go crazy. She wasn't evil. She was just a person who happened to have power and tried to make the most of her life. Uh, you guys all take a look at page 1058. 1058. Um, I want to, to draw your attention to this passage because... Um, Everything that I've ever read about the play, they say that this is one of the most famous, this is one of the most famous passages in the play. And it says a lot about the Duchess's character. Um, yeah, but this is when Basola is kind of, we still got to talk about him, but this is when he's kind of toying with, with the Duchess. Like, at this point, she knows that he's a rat. She previously trusted him, but now she now she knows that uh, he's a rat. And he's, try, he's kind of trying to um, undermine her away in this passage. Like, hey, you're not as special as you think you are. But um, this, is, this is the passage where she really sort of maintains her dignity. Yeah, if you, we can we can go through this whole page. We could we could go through this whole page, but um, if you look at line, this is Act Four, Scene Two, about line one twenty six. The soloist says, "Thou art a box of worm seed, at best but a salivatory of green mummy. What's this flesh? A little crudded milk, fantastical puff paste." Our bodies are weaker than these paper prisons boys used to keep flies in. We're contemptible, since ours is to preserve earthworms. Didst thou ever see a lark in a cage? Such is the soul in the body. This world is like her little turf of grass, and the heaven over our heads like her looking glass only gives us a miserable knowledge of the small compass of our prison. Uh, a soul... The soul is kind of um, throwing out some philosophy there, right? Duchess, am I not thy duchess? 
Thou art some great woman, sure, for riot begins to sit on thy forehead, clad in gray hairs twenty years sooner than a merry milkmaid's. Thou sleepest worse than if a mouse should be forced to take up her lodging in a cat's eat car. The little infant that breeds its teeth should it lie with thee would cry out as if thou wert the more unquiet bedfellow. Then her great line in the play, I am Duchess of Malfi still. Right. So all this all this parts where he's he's kind of trying to undermine her, trying to show that she's that her title means nothing, it's all meaningless. Even when the Pope takes away her title from her. She asserts herself right there, right? She says, I am Duchess of Malfi still. Right? Nothing, nothing you can do to me, right, will will stop me from being the Duchess of Malfi. Right? That, that is who I am. That's my God-given title. Right? So uh yeah, Savannah, you said earlier she's a girl boss, right? That that's her great girl boss line in the uh, in the whole play, right? Not, nothing you can do or say can change the fact I'm the Duchess of Malfi, right? Real real cool line. Yeah, any any time I've seen commentaries on this play, always that that passage is always mentioned. She's got some other good lines too, but that's the one zinger. Just like next week when we talk about Hamlet, the zinger in that place to be or not to be, that is the question. Right. That that's the zinger in this play. When when Josh does Macbeth in a few weeks, there's some zingers in there too that have become part of our expressions that we use. So um we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss the soul of um, his, well, how do we even define this guy? Is he a villain? Yeah. Um, is he fully evil? Um, maybe not. Right. He seems. He seems to conf He seems to have guilt and remorse for his actions. Um, yeah. You know, this guy is such a comp this guy's a lot more complicated, I think, than the other characters in this play. It's it's gonna be kind of a challenge to wrap our minds around this guy. Um I wish I could have had more time to prepare. I could have probably written down some more faults. But um if I was just gonna try to wax poetically randomly, kind of like you guys are are. Um I would say of this guy, right? I feel like he is kind of a victim of circumstance, right? He, I feel like he, feel, because he's kind of a, of a lower class himself, I feel like he feels trapped into doing the will of these aristocrats, right? This, he thinks that he's going to secure his financial future by doing all this stuff. But, um, he seems he's he seems to me very self aware of what he's doing. Uh, he seems he seems to know that like he he kind of toys with the Duchess on that passage of this review. But um, I, how the word for him is malcontent, right? This is a Hamlet next week is a malcontent too. Like he understands what makes society tick, and he's not that happy about it. He's kind of a morose character, kind of 
kind of an emo character in a way, right? Like he, he kind of rails against all the injustices of a society while he himself is doing the injustices of the society, if, if that makes sense. Um, it's interesting that he has this change of heart in the play. Like, we could argue, if you remember Ferdinand at the end, Ferdinand, um, the soul is like, hey, dude, I killed your sister. Um, pay me my money. Ferdinand's like, I'm not going to pay you money. You killed my sister. You're a disgusting murderer. Uh, he, he, even though he's the one who ordered it. We, we didn't mention that about Ferdinand earlier. He, he kind of uh, tries to cheap out on Basola. So maybe Basola had purely revenge motives. Like, hey, I did all this crazy stuff that's probably d damned me to hell. And uh, this guy's not even going to pay me pay me my money and so, so maybe maybe that was his biggest motivation but um yeah he he's that that's what i would say most about them like just waxing aloud just like the rest of you guys he seems to me um like he's kind of aware that he's causing these evils and he's perpetuating these evils but he's at least aware that he is doing evil. And I guess at the end, he tries to make up for it somehow uh, by killing the Cardinal and Ferdinand. Like, like or maybe these guys would get away with it if it wasn't for the soul. But whether his reasons are purely altruistic um, I wouldn't go that far. Um, but, you know, that's, that's just me speaking aloud. We'll, we'll go back in reverse order again. Uh, Daryl, what did you think of the soul? Um, I, I think most of what you said is pretty accurate. He, he tends to change the way he thinks a after the the killing of the duchess and all that but it is kind of hard to tell like is he doing it because he wants the money is he doing it because he had a moral change is what what why does why is he in this business to begin with it's sort of odd to get a read on him kind of like what you said earlier i i it's obvious he's a big part of the play because when it comes down to it he's sort of responsible for the deaths of every character who died including his own. So it's just, um, it is really odd to think about where his morals were, what thoughts were going through his head when he made all these decisions that led up to the the tragedy of the story. And there's no doubt that he's a big, you know, part of the story, but I just don't really know how to describe him or what to classify him as as a character. Yeah, it's this classic question of who is more evil, right? Is it the person ordering the assassin, the assassination, or is it the actual assassin who does it, right? That that's that's kind of a, a classic philosophical question, like which one's worse? Um, back in, um, let's see what what was that guy's name? Hold on, I'm, I'm having a brain fart with where I'm going here. Yeah, you know, it makes it reminds me of the Nazis. Right? You can relate everything to Nazis, but um, like, of course, Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler and all those guys were. The brains of um, the Third Reich, especially things like the Holocaust. But you had people too, like Adolf Eichmann, who uh, led and organized the concentration camps, who 
help people like Hitler and him Himmler never got their hands dirty. They did the ordering. But people like Eichmann were the ones who really carried out those orders and um and created those evils. Right. So the the question that's what that's kind of what Basola makes me think of, right? Who is the greater evil here? Is it the brothers or is it him? For actually doing what they tell him to do. Like he could draw a line in the sand and say, hey, you get somebody else to do this. Um, maybe, maybe at the cost of his of his life, maybe, right? I don't I don't know. But mor morally speaking, who is worse in um, this scenario? But whenever I'm talking about Adolf Eichmann, um, the Jew the Jews clearly thought that he was just as bad as Hitler. Um, Eichmann, if you guys know your history, right? Eichmann actually moved to South America um, after World War II. He tried to start a new life. And uh, it's one of the coolest stories that Israeli spies went and captured him and took him back to Israel much against, I think it was Argentina, I might be wrong, much against their protesting because Argentina housed a lot of Nazi war criminals. But they took him back and they put him on trial and um, his argument was, it wasn't my idea, I just did what I was told. Well, um, is, that, is that worse than uh, the person committing the order in the first place. Um, yeah, I, I kind of threw a whole other curveball in the discussion. Um, if one of you guys want to pick, if any of you guys want to catch the curve and uh, address my point, go for it. But um, we'll keep moving down the line. Josh, I don't know if you want to answer the curveball or. Uh, Describe your own thoughts on Basola, but um... I, I am going to address the curveball. Okay. So, uh, so uh, the uh, your mention of the uh, Nazis reminded me of I don't know if you've heard of this. Uh, it reminded me of the Milgram experiment, where uh, they have they have the they have volunteers, and then they have them do, and they have them ask a series of questions, and if the contestant gets them gets them wrong then the person in in the volunteer has to shock them and they have to keep increasing the electroshock doses now the whole thing was fake the uh people getting shocked was just an actor and there wasn't actually any shocking shocking electricity going on but uh the point of the experiment was to show how many how far are people willing to go just because uh a person in a lab coat told them to do to do that thing. So I think in this instance, it's kind of similar to that, where the guy just kind of does it just because he just because the higher ups told him to. Because he grew up in the culture where if the bit if the guy in the noble house tells them to do it, then who are you to question the guy who's in charge. So would you would you say then that the person who agrees to keep perpetuating it is just as as bad morally as the person who ordered it? I would think to some extent they are, because you know they're still they're making the decision to be involved, but let's not forget that the person who's giving the orders know, knows very well that if they tell somebody to do it, somebody's going to follow it. That's my thoughts on it. Right. Yeah, some, somebody will. Like if they're, uh, to take my Holocaust example, right? If Eichmann wouldn't have done that, somebody else in Nazi Germany would have. Um, so a good point, Josh. Um, 
Savannah, or you can take the Sola or the Curve Wall or both here. Um, I'm going to step back on the Curve Wall. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk about the Sola for a minute. I feel like he is very much a middle guy, but then again, not. Because he went through with all this stuff. He had the decision to go through with the plan and go through with killing the kids and the white or and uh, mafia. And it's like the sad villain story because he realized then, man, this is not right. This I need to stop this. This needs to quit. What have I done? He feels the guilt from it, and he tries to get it to end. And uh, But then again, he goes to Ferdinand and tells him about it and still tries to basically get his dues. And Ferdinand's like, what are you talking about now? And I feel like he is a villain that had potential to be worse, but then again had potential to be better. He could have ended up helping them and letting them have their life. What gets me with him is I have the bitest, the slightest bit of sympathy only because he arranged for Antonio's friend to have the son and hopefully restore the family line and all that. That's the only thing that gives me the slightest bit of sympathy for him. Right, so that that did redeem him somewhat. Yeah, I, I agree, Savannah. After all the um, tragedy that he causes, at least there's that one glimmer of light at the end, where maybe that, maybe um, that heir will continue the family name for the better, right? Hopefully. So yeah, that I like you. I like what you said there. Like he's a villain. He could have been worse. He could have been more heroic. Right? I, I like he's kind of he's kind of a middle ground. I, 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 thought, I like I like that. That was good. Um, last but not least, faith, uh, curveball, the sola, both or both. Um, I feel like the curveball was already discussed pretty well. I don't really have anything to add to it. So I'll go ahead and talk about the guy. Mm -hmm. I like him as a villain because you don't really see villains a lot recognize their wrongdoings. Um, there's a lot of potential for a redemption arc for him. However, there is also potential for him to get worse, like what Savannah said. So I like the way that he was written you don't really see that all the time do you feel like he did redeem himself somewhat faith but... a little bit i think so at least he was able to recognize the problem yeah it's rare that you see a evil character right be so um, examine their conscience so much, right? Like, like I would say, I would go as, like a, in Shakespeare, you'll see it too. But I think I feel like Webster does an even better job at this. Um, this sort of examination of conscience, Macbeth will when we read it in a couple of weeks. He does some horrible things. He kind of examines his conscience. But I would even that's a question we can go back to in a couple of weeks. But I would even argue not as much so as as Basola here. 
So let's uh, let's wrap up the conversation with this. This is our first uh, tragedy from the Renaissance period that we that we read. We read one comedy and one tragedy. We're going to read two more tragedies, Hamlet and Macbeth. Um, but when it comes to tragedy, um, we've only got one example, right? But we read, we read several tragedies from the Greek period. Medea, Lysistrata, or not Lysistrata, Medea, Agamemnon, and uh, Oedipus. Um, what would you guys say is well, which 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 version of tragedy do you prefer? Uh, which version do you find more compelling, or maybe even more complicated? Did you like Did you like the Renaissance brand a little more than the Greek, or are some of you guys still hanging on to the Greek? Or maybe you kind of realize, maybe you kind of appreciate the Greeks for what they were. They're the OGs. But uh, maybe the Renaissance kind of improved on it. Um, let's start with you, Faith. We'll go back down to to uh, Josh. Greek or Renaissance? What what would you what what would your vote be? I feel like they're both good in their own ways. Like I can't really choose one or the other. Like with the Greek tragedy, it's like balls to the wall. There's murder, there's a whole bunch of stuff. But with the Renaissance, it's like more civilized and human. Not really that barbaric in a sense that the Greek tragedies were. Right. Yeah, I like what you said about more human. Right. You, you get a lot more like a lot I would say you get a lot more psychological depth with these with the Renaissance like the fact that we've had a two hour long conversation just uh, the six of us right just kind of goes to show you that um, there's a lot of depth there of course Daryl uh, you mentioned you like you like this you thought this play compared to Romeo. So I'm kind of guessing you're going to vote Renaissance, but tell me if I'm wrong. I think that we still have two very big Renaissance tragedies coming up, so I'm not entirely sure. What, what is it? I'm I said you're, you're withholding your judgment until those other two? Uh, yeah, just because, again, um, I think I also mentioned this last week. Whenever I think of you know, plays you read in high school or like very famous Shakespeare plays. I think of Hamlet and Macbeth as like the big two. And I was supposed to read them in 11th grade again, but then COVID hit, we got out in March and I never got to. So getting to, you know, read about those and learn about those, maybe that would heighten my, you know, enjoyment of Renaissance tragedies more, maybe, um, maybe even less in it, but I'd highly doubt that. And it's sort of just, I, I really don't know. I, I, I really like a lot of the Greek ones. I really like some of the Renaissance ones. And I would rather wait to, you know, save my judgment upon reading the next two. But, um, yeah, they're, they're both good in their own way. It's sort of, um, I really do like what Faith said. They are more, uh, the Greek ones are more, I don't know how you put it, vulgar or... Um, mm like uh, gritty, sort of just the very old school and very, um, that they kind of didn't hold back. And then these Renaissance ones are, they're more human, they're more uh, emotion um, forward and more human forward instead of like gods and goddesses having influence on some people. So yeah, I, I, I feel like once I read these next two, I'll have a, a better answer for it. But I definitely have favorites in both categories, and I don't really know which one's my favorite yet uh, of the two types of tragedies we've went over. Fair enough, fair enough. Now, later in the class, you'll read some more modern types of tragedies. So, um, yeah, th it'll be interesting to even revisit this question late in the class. 
in December. Um, Savannah, do you like the the Greek stuff or the Renaissance, Renaissance stuff more so far? I hate to say it, I'm about like Daryl because I enjoyed this very, very much. And I hope that the rest of the Renaissance is like this as much, as far as it goes as attention grabbing. I hate to say it with the Greek. I just I had a horrible time trying mm. not to nod off. <laughs> right. Like I understand a lot of it did have some good points. Like what was it? Medea, it had a good storyline, but it was just very quick and done over with as far as it goes as you seen very quickly how she was just going to basically destroy the whole storyline. Destroy the kids, destroy her husband that absolutely betrayed her. It was just very much... I don't know. I feel like this one had more detail in it, I guess, in a way. Had more, like more detail and pacing. Right? Yeah, definitely. So I hope the rest of the Renaissance is like this as far as like attention grabbing. Um yeah, the the page length is says it all, right? This one's the longest thing we've read in here. So far, um, Oedipus was like 40 pages. Um, D is like 30 pages. This one was like 70 or 80 pages. So, um, yeah, definitely a longer, more developed type of text. I agree with you, Savannah. Whether you like the short and sweet or the uh, long and complicated, right? that, that's more the, of the taste thing, I would say. Josh, not last but not least, you had the final word today. I would say I would agree with everybody else on what they said about the uh, the uh, different forms of tragedy. I think they both are pretty good. I enjoyed both ty both types. I would say I'm a little bit, you know, biased toward you know more Shakespearean stuff ju just because I was raised around uh, you know. Shakespearean type uh, literature so in that sense I'm a little bit biased but I would say both are pretty good in their own way yeah I get, I used to be all renaissance and I was like that Greek stuff is too uh, too simple but um, the more uh, the more I mature as a reader the more I appreciate the Greeks. So I'm, I'm kind of like you guys. Um, um, I think you guys can tell just based on my reading choices that I'm a big fan of the Renaissance. Um, some and other teachers might choose to skim over it and get to the um, more the more modern stuff quicker than me. So I, I think you guys can kind of tell that I'm a big fan of this period. Um, but um, I like I spent a lot of time with the Greeks too so I think that says a lot about who I am as a, as a teacher that I enjoy both of them so much it's kind of funny guys I did my doctorate in modern American literature and it's rare that I ever teach modern American literature like I get the most joy out of teaching this older stuff. It's kind of funny how uh, my career has worked out that way. I did all that work in American Lit, and I don't even teach it much. I teach all this old stuff. That's just what I like to teach more, frankly. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny how that how it worked out that way for me. Now, Daryl has took me for multiple classes now, so he's starting to see the repetition in my teaching, right? Right, Daryl, like the, the discussion questions are the same, right? <laughs> yeah, it's mostly just there's different genres of stories. You know, like the first one, we, we mostly just wrote papers. 
the uh, the second class was gothic fiction and then this one's more you know old school english uh the the theater and the western world literature are kind of the same with the the greek the renaissance and then we eventually make our way to what more modern stuff is right yeah we'll we'll spend more time with the more modern stuff in this class than we will the other one i don't in the other class i don't think it I don't even get that close to the modern period before we run out of time. So one last thing, guys, I'm going to put a link. So in two weeks, next week we're reading Hamlet. Hamlet is in your book. Um, but in two weeks, we're going to read Macbeth. Macbeth isn't in the book. Um, we can, I can definitely find you some versions. I can try to find you a version online of it that's readable. Uh, you guys know, though, with, with Renaissance drama, with Shakespeare, even Webster here, right? It helps to have good footnotes and some type to explain the context of stuff. Um, if you don't have those footnotes, sometimes you might get a little lost in the meanings. I think that's a safe thing to say. I think our textbook does a really awesome job with footnotes. Um, but with Macbeth, I would recommend this version. You know, I'm going to copy and paste it in the chat. But if you get on Amazon, this is what's called the Arden Shakespeare version. This is the authoritative, that, that's the authoritative version. So that's what Shakespeare scholars, whenever, whenever you read a Shakespeare journal or whatever, that's what they cite. And they have notes in there that are a little overkill. Like they have way more notes than uh, even our book does. But um, if I was going to, that one's actually pretty cheap too. So if I was going to recommend you pick one up, um, if you don't want to read it on a computer screen, if you want to pick one up, that's the one I would um, recommend you. Okay, so we have two weeks till we read it, a week till you maybe start reading it. So if, if you guys are so inclined, order, I would say order that. Um, and you'll have a very good reading experience that way if you use that one, I think. Hamlet next week's in our book, so nothing will change there. Okay, did did that link work for you guys? Did any of you click it? Macbeth, Art and Shakespeare, third series. Uh, yes, it worked for me. Yeah, yeah, Josh, I don't know if you began preparing for that presentation yet, but especially for you, I would recommend that version that you're going to be our presenter that week. I'll keep it in mind. I have written a few notes on it. I haven't started making the presentation yet, but I do have some ideas on where I want to make a presentation about. Very good. Daryl, you are our presenter next week on, on Hamlet. So, um, yeah, I will. I will look forward to that. Um, if any of you guys want to show me your presentation beforehand, feel free to send it to me, and I'll give you some early feedback. So, uh, like it. So, just the update. So, I'll give you guys another grammar quiz this week on prepositional phrases and uh, relative clauses. So I'll send you guys an email when that's up. Other than that, um, I should be mostly caught up on grading for you guys since I sent you back your papers. So if you haven't got on Brightspace yet to look at my comments, do so. Um, I was very pleased with them as a class, very pleased. But if you got a grade that uh, you want to improve on, I will allow a revision on it. So all you, what I would ask you to do, if you make some changes, um, maybe put in, like how I comment on your papers with those comment bubbles, 
if you add anything new to your paper, maybe put those comment bubbles in just as kind of like a signpost saying, hey, I changed some stuff here. I added some more stuff. So if you do make some changes, um, I would say do it that way. But let's say that I need to put a timeline on it. If I give you guys too much time, um, I'll be reading revisions at the end of the semester, which is never ideal. What, since you guys aren't working on a paper right now, let's say I'll make revisions of paper one due by the 18th. So if any of you guys want to conduct a revision, if you got a B or a C, if any of you guys want to conduct a revision, next, I'll give you until next Tuesday to do it. Okay. Uh, now go, I'd be happy if everybody in this class got an A. Okay. But if you didn't get that A on your paper, your first go, work on it some more and get where you need to be. So I will allow that, okay? But I'll close revisions off after the 18th. So get those in by next week if you want to do a revision. I'm, I'm not going to open a Dropbox for the revision. I figure there won't be many people do them. But if you do do one, just send it to me in an email, and that'll be fine. But again, I was very pleased with the class. Uh, mostly A's and B's, if I, if I recall. So... Um, yeah, very, very good work. Very good work. Yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased with you guys as, as a class. Um, I told you guys before, Tuesday nights are awesome. Like, you guys are a nice pick me up during my week. So I appreciate you all. I appreciate you all reading and participating and uh, making this a, a great experience for everybody. So thank you. So, um, any last minute questions, comments, concerns before we hang up for the night? All right, guys. Uh, take care. I'll see you all next week. Take care. Thank see you for the class. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Josh. Have a good night. See you, Savannah.